In this video, we focus on the analysis and interpretation of metabolomics data that were collected using LCMS or GCMS. This follows directly in the workflow from our earlier video where we looked at the overall process of generating treatment and control samples, extracting the organic metabolites from those samples, then subjecting those chemical extracts to separation by LC or GC, followed by data acquisition using mass spectrometry. So now what we're going to do is look at what do we do with that wealth of LCMS or GCMS data that we collect. Because in these experiments, generally we will be running large numbers, sometimes upwards of 10 or more replicates of treatments and controls generating LCMS data or GCMS data for each of those samples. And then we need to interpret that large amount of data. So with so much data to interpret in these metabolomics experiments, we rely heavily upon computational techniques to explore the data that result from these experiments. There are two types of analyses that we can conduct when we are looking at the data that result from these LCMS and GCMS experiments. One of those types of analyses is what's referred to as a targeted analysis. We would refer to this as targeted metabolomics. And as the term targeted implies, we're seeking specific molecules in the experiment. So for example, the human metabolome has been heavily explored and we know of about 40,000 different metabolites that are present in a database of the human metabolome. So we conceivably could conduct targeted metabolomics by seeking a specific set of those known molecular ions. In other words, looking for known metabolites that correspond to an existing database. So in targeted metabolomics, what we're seeking is a specific set of metabolites and examining that set of metabolites in terms of quantitative aspects or qualitative aspects. So seek a specific set of metabolites and evaluate what change has occurred in those individual metabolites that we're targeting as a result of whatever treatment was conducted. The other variation of the analysis is rather than doing targeted metabolomics, we can also use what's referred to as untargeted metabolomics where we aren't looking for specific individual mass to charge ratios corresponding to individual known metabolites, but instead we apply the analysis software to compare the treatment and control samples for qualitative and or quantitative differences without a bias to look for specific known molecules. So untargeted is where we're going to compare treatment and control, which I'll abbreviate as T and C. metabolomes are going to be compared for qualitative and quantitative differences, not seeking specific metabolites, not seeking specific known metabolites. So what the rest of this discussion is going to focus on predominantly is going to be on the untargeted side of the equation because that is generally the more technically demanding side of the analysis spectrum is looking for the needle in a haystack of what specific compounds out of this huge mixture of different compounds that we evaluated distinguish treatment samples from control samples if we have no idea what particular compounds we are, we are looking for to distinguish our treatment and control samples. So we are going to walk through the data analysis workflow for these untargeted metabolomics experiments using this as our visual guide for doing so. So what we do in the data analysis is we begin by looking in this data analysis at the first bit here where I will zoom in. And what you see in this panel are in the top window right here, we see the LCMS trace for our treatment samples. 
And you can see that if you look really closely and we zoom way in here, you can see in this in the trace that it's actually several different traces that are superposed with one another rather than just one LCMS trace. It's a bunch of them that are clustered tightly together here. And those represent the individual LCMS runs of the replicate sample. So a huge amount of data here. And then likewise, down below in the green traces, we have the traces that resulted from our replicate control samples. And we have those plotted with retention time here on the x-axis, as is common in LC-MS experiments. And then on the y-axis is the relative abundance. And normally when we're doing untargeted metabolomics, that would be the relative abundance of the so-called total ion count. The total ion count or the tick is referring to the abundance of whatever ion was coming through the column at a particular time point. So at this particular time point, we could say there's a relatively high total ion count because the signal is relatively large. And the total ion count accounts for the full range of ions over which we are scanning. So it's not looking for a specific mass to charge ratio. Instead, it's scanning a wide range in contrast to a selected ion recording, which we talked about in an earlier video, where we're looking for a specific mass to charge ratio. Here, since we're doing untargeted metabolomics, we are looking at the total ion count here for our control versus treatment replicates that we are going through here. And this is certainly a very complex data set. Someone would be hard pressed to look at these two data sets and be able to visually assess which compounds differ between the two samples, especially if we start to think in terms of quantitating these and determining which compounds are upregulated in treatments relative to controls. And so in order to simplify these data, there are a variety of computational tools that have been designed to accomplish such things as what's referred to as peak picking. Peak picking is the process where we introduce each of the data sets, meaning all of the replicate treatment and control data sets into a program such as what's referred to as XCMS. The X here refers to the fact that this could be a data that derived from GC or LC. So that's why it's referred to as XCMS because X could be L or G for GCMS or LCMS. And this particular program referred to as XCMS has the ability to pick individual peaks out of the LCMS traces for your treatment relative to your control and will plot those based on the particular mass to charge ratios that exist within that entire mixture. So it's matching up both the retention times of individual compounds between treatments and controls and the full set of mass spectrometry data as well to confirm that two compounds at the same retention time are actually the same compound. And then it also evaluates the intensity of those signals in an automated fashion to compare and compile the abundance of the particular compounds in the treatment sample relative to the control sample. At that point, statistical analyses are carried out to determine particular features that distinguish the treatment sample from the control sample. In other words, at this stage of the software analysis game, what we are doing is evaluating differences, specifically chemical differences, detectable by mass spectrometry, that distinguish the treatment and the control. And for this, generally these softwares will give a specific list of compound mass to charge ratios and retention times that have been upregulated or downregulated in response to treatment. Also, typically programs will compile meta analyses, meaning looking at multiple compounds at a time that are able to distinguish treatments from controls. And those analyses of pools of compounds that distinguish treatments and controls can be used to create such things as what we see here, which is referred to as 
a principal component analysis plot, or PCA. So principal component analysis plot, or PCA plot, enables us to determine and answer the question of whether the treatment and control samples have different molecular fingerprints overall. So do the treatment and control have different molecular fingerprints? Because if the treatment and control samples have different molecular fingerprints, that means that we could then take other samples of additional related treatments and controls and distinguish those using particular biomarkers, particular metabolites that we can predictably use to distinguish between treatments and controls. And in interpreting a PCA plot, what we will see in the case of the treatments and controls being distinguishable from one another is different clusters of signals. So in the case of this example PCA plot here, what we find in this PCA plot of treatment samples in green versus samples here, which we refer to as the placebos, those are the controls, what we see is a different clustering of the LCMS metabolite profiles, where all of the treatments cluster into this green circle here, whereas all the controls are spread in this range of the principal component analysis plot. And so that indicates that there is the ability to separate these two groups based on the particular metabolites that are present in each. If instead we saw that the two data sets were interspersed, in other words, that the red symbols representing the principal components of the treatment, or the control rather, relative to the green dots of the treatment, if those were all interspersed with one another, we would indicate that we can't distinguish by this principal components analysis the treatment from the control. But here there's definitely a very well distinguished demarcation between the control replicates, each replicate is represented by a dot here, and the treatment replicates, each of which is represented by the green cross type shape here. So we can tell those apart using this so-called principal components analysis technique, which is a really common way of compiling and evaluating the data resulting from these metabolomics experiments. And we can use that in order to establish an overall molecular fingerprint of a treatment versus a control. So then we could go back and evaluate additional samples and we could predict based on where they fell within the molecular fingerprint region, whether that particular unknown sample corresponded to a treatment or a control. This can be really useful in examples such as the diagnosis of disease. If we have a clear metabolite profile of healthy individuals, for example, versus diseased individuals, and then we evaluate an unknown sample, meaning a sample that was from a person who we didn't know whether they had the disease or not, and the sample fell within the green region, that would suggest that that was a diseased individual. On the other hand, if it fell into the red region using the principal components analysis, that would suggest that it was from a healthy individual. So up until this point of our workflow here, we have talked about evaluating whether compounds are up or down regulated. We haven't talked yet about how to actually identify those compounds. And that is something that very commonly in thinking about the next steps and in thinking about applying metabolomics data, identification of the compounds is very typically something that is of great interest because if we are trying to understand a biological system, generally we don't just want to know the fingerprint of are some compounds upregulated and some compounds downregulated. Instead, to take it a step further and really understand the biological system, we need to know exactly what metabolites are upregulated and what metabolites are downregulated. And so that's where the next step of this workflow comes in of identifying the individual metabolites that are present and detected in those metabolomics experiments. And so fortunately for those of us that conduct metabolomics, there are a variety of databases available, such as some of the ones listed here, that contain data corresponding to the expected mass spectral properties for a variety of 
metabolites, ranging from some databases specialized to human metabolites. This is the HMDB, the Human Metabolome Database. METLIN, which contains bacterial metabolites and a variety of others. NIST cont- uh, maintains a metabolite database and a variety of other sources as well. And so what can be done, again, in a automated computer software-based fashion, much like the other steps of this analysis, is the data resulting from our mass spectrometry experiments can be input into these databases to enable the identification of individual compounds by matching up the mass spectral data between compounds present in our sample with those present in the database. And these databases focus both on, depending upon the database, MS1 data, meaning the intact molecular ion, as well as MS2 data, referring to those fragments or daughter ions that result from that result from breaking some of the weak bonds within molecules by bombarding them with additional energy during the mass spectral process. And so what we see down here in this plot at the bottom is a comparison between the mass spectrum of a unknown compound from the metabolomics experiment. And then mirroring that down here below is the mass spectrum that is the best fit from the database that this was compared to. And so you can see a variety of signals matching up at different retention times throughout the mass to charge range for this particular individual compound with mass to charge ratios of 55, 70, and so on and so forth on down the line. We see a lot of matching up of these various signals here, supporting that the compound, the unknown up top here, is indeed the compound from the database that is shown below here, which could be any variety of different established biological molecules. Now, in the event that someone found a really diagnostic molecule that clearly dis- was a single molecule that distinguished between a treatment and control sample. They wanted to identify that compound and these databases turned up nothing. In other words, when one went to compare this mass spectrum for the experimental sample from the metabolomics experiment with those available in the database, it said, we don't have any clear hit. At that point, if someone wanted to identify that particular molecule, what they would have to do is generate sufficient quantity to use analytical tools such as X-ray crystallography, mass spectrometry, and NMR in order to identify that compound by conducting 2D NMR experiments or crystallizing the compound and getting the X-ray diffraction pattern to identify that particular molecule. So that would be taking this a step further down the line. But in general, when we're thinking about the analysis of data in these metabolomics experiments, the workflow for analyzing data is we superpose the treatment and control data. We then use software to pick specific peaks to evaluate the data as a whole using a statistical analysis as this principal components analysis to establish fingerprints that differentiate controls from treatments And then we can go in and identify individual metabolites by comparing to databases that exist. Or alternatively, if there's no match with a database, by going in and isolating and identifying particular individual compounds by using tools such as NMR.